What if you could sit down once a week with a colleague who's a flat out warrior? This colleague wasn't a stud in dental school. He struggled. He returned to practice in his hometown, an area once labeled by USA Today as the second worst place to live economically in the United States. And this very same colleague went on to establish an historically successful general practice known worldwide. What if he knew someone that wanted to take you by the hand and show you everything you need to know, from treatment planning to leadership, to maximizing your journey in dentistry or just life? You ready to be inspired? Welcome to the Lion Army. Hi, everyone. Dr. Steve Brasner here, and welcome back to the Lionhearted Dental Podcast. It's already March, early March, and you should be assessing where you're at already. If you care about taking the next step of getting to the positively reachable goal of fulfillment as a dentist, whether you're an associate in private practice, you're still in dental school, and your journey is just beginning, which is beautiful because you haven't made any mistakes yet. And that's the whole point, by the way, of this podcast, to help you shorten the road to getting to a place of fulfillment. You know, and I used that word twice already, but it rings and resonates to those of us that, those of us that have been out here in dentistry for quite some time. Not everybody finds that. And you put a lot of time and energy and sacrifice into being a physician of the mouth. And you owe it to yourself to explore every avenue and not just give up because you run into a wall here and there, which does happen to all of us, and think it's the wrong profession. So that's why I'm here. I'm in a pretty good mood. Today, it's a Sunday. I just gave my first spring course of live extractions and grafting. And I say that to you because it's hard not to be inspired when you have 12 or 14 dentists come in from around the country and are unbelievably ahead of their game. Some of them were in their 20s. And let me tell you, I, I don't know what you're supposed to say and not say on a podcast, but I can tell you I tell my patients I'm not the dollar store. And I can tell you that my private courses in my office on live patients are not an inexpensive investment. They are. And to see spring and fall and year after year, the clinicians that have invested to change the trajectory of their of their careers is all inspiring to me and to you got to have guts to do that it does it takes guts to come into a course and practice procedures on live patients we're not on pig jaws we're not on cadaver heads these are live breathing patients by the way, that you can participate in in the future if you have a license in the United States, an active license. It's incredible. I guess we're doing something right because we have an amazing amount of repeats. And I was really worried, and it's kind of relevant to what I'm going to talk about today, about because I'm going to continue the goals that you should have this year to maximize your personal and professional productivity. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But I was concerned because, as you know, I had spinal surgery just 10 weeks ago. And I sat in this very chair a couple of weeks after I had it and tried to do a podcast, and I couldn't. I couldn't even hear my voice on my computer. And I'm certainly not at the top of my game physically. But you have to be a warrior. You have to be a warrior if you want to reach the lofty heights that are there in front of you. Now, I had one colleague in this course 
this weekend who sent two of his associates. He's become a good friend of mine. I don't know if he'll be mad at me for saying it. I don't think so. His name is Dr. Bob Spinato. And he sent two of his associates to the course. That is a huge, huge commitment. But he knows, and I'm not doing this, by the way, as an infomercial to try to you know get you to sign up. If this course is over, my next course in May may have one spot left in it, and, it's, and that's on implants, by the way. I'm simply telling you it's inspiring to me to see Bob is a little younger than me, and he cares, and he's at that stage in his development of his practice where he's kind of looking ahead. You know, those of you out there that are own, own a dental practice, do you want to be the only one that can do the challenging procedures which is what I did, by the way. It was a mistake in my career. You you know, yes, I'm, Steve Rasner was the one that's going to do all the bone grafts, the difficult extractions, and this and that. And that's not really a way to scale your practice, increase your productivity. If you're the only one, this, listen, think about it. What happens when you're not there? What happens when you want to go on vacation? Everything dropped in my career over my length of my career because I really had nobody else to step up and do the procedures I was capable of doing. You know, and I salute my friend Bob and, and others that have done it. I have a, a fellow from Nebraska that sent me a ton of people and somebody from California sent one of their doctors here this weekend, and I'm saying that to you because if you're in that position where you're into your practice, like you may be in five, 10 years, and but you're the only one because you, you're, you're relying on your education and you experience what I experience. Like when you're not there, things kind of drop off the cliff in terms of productivity, in terms of efficiency. And that's not good for you personally. So I guess, you know, I, I'm just, you're hearing my energy, which I'm so thankful for it. I have energy back and it's going to translate into this week's subject, which I'm going to get into right now. But thanks to all my colleagues that taught this weekend with me, uh, you know, Gabe Rees, uh, my, my associate and colleague and Dr. G and Trey from Arizona. Yeah, I'm. I'm shouting out to them, if you will. And uh, one of our newest uh, mentors was a student of mine, and he's uh, an absolute stud from California. His name is Anthony DeFont. So, uh, you know, I didn't even ask any of these guys if I could say these things, but um, thanks. <laughs> so let me get to why you tuned in this week. I want to take you back for a minute. I began this year by telling you the steps to become a lion-hearted practice. Remember I said, let's, let's attack this year, 2023, as if we were starting over. That's what I said. As if you were beginning your practice or just, I actually wrote an article on this that was very well received many, many years ago called, I was in dentistry today and it was called Eight steps if I started over on Monday. And I had been in practice at that time for about, you know, 25 years. So this really isn't off that article I wrote. I'm doing this cold from how I feel today, 42 years into this. And you remember that I said on step one back in January that you need to become amazing at something in dentistry. Now, why wouldn't you want to do that? And I, and I think that's a really important one for you to think about because, you know, listen, Strupp and Brum down in Clearwater, Florida, they don't, to my knowledge, they don't do any surgical procedures. I don't even know if they do endo or perio procedures, but they're amazing in restorative. To me, they are, and to many, many of their 20,000 or so followers. And so that's what they're amazing in. 
Many of you are amazing in Invisalign and so forth. Endo. It doesn't have to be surgery like I advocate, but that is my journey. That's, that's why you hear that from me. You know, it's not because I have courses in it. I have courses in it because it was my journey. And I find the easiest route for my colleagues to me, that's what I believe in, to get you to a place where you can work four days a week, not weekends, not evenings, and not burn out and provide services to your patients in your community that they will so much appreciate and spread your name in a positive way the shortest route to that to me is have a oral sedation practice. If you have an oral sedation practice, then you have to know how to take teeth out surgically. If you take teeth out surgically, you have to know what to do when in terms of grafting and membranes and socket seals, which is what the last course I gave this weekend was about. And if you're going to do all that, I have to highly encourage you to incorporate some level of surgical and prosthetic implant dentistry. I didn't say you ever have to do sinus lifts or ramus grafts or split block techniques or even uh, all on fours. I don't do those. And so, but you need to become amazing at something. And I, again, I would have to ask those that would I don't know, disagree, why wouldn't you want to be amazing at something? And I'm going to say one more time before I go to number two, the easiest thing, the easiest service for you to come amazing at is to acquire an oral sedation permit in your state or your country. And I know many, many of you listen globally in Europe and Canada and quite honestly, at this stage of this podcast, all over the world. And you need to quit just listening. And you need to do the third step, which I haven't gotten to today. And that's putting thoughts into action. So step one is becoming amazing at something. I went over this this year. Step two is delegating task in your office. Now you got to be a leader to do that. And making the people that you work around be accountable. Delegating task so you don't get burned out and do everything. And I mean delegate everything. From somebody in charge of changing the light bulbs to cleaning the kitchen or the break room to ordering supplies to taking care of repairing the equipment, everything, so that you don't have to nickel and dime your brain to make the office operate at top level. And that takes, if you, can, if you, if you don't have that personality, then you better have a manager that has that personality, right? So, and if you don't have that staff, then either you don't have the right staff or you'll never reach a lion-hearted dental practice if you try to do this all yourself. Everybody talks about the importance of staff. I'm putting it in your face how that, what that really means. Yeah, staff's incredibly important, but not a staff that clocks in from eight to four or eight to five and checks out and doesn't have any investment in the growth and function of your operation. That's just a staff member. We can get them anywhere. You need people that believe in the philosophy, your philosophy of your practice. And they're not, by the way, going to follow you and help you, which mine have done for many, many, many years. If you're not a good leader, if you're not appreciative, if you, I mean, there's so much to say here. So one has become amazing. Two is to enlist the team and delegate to the team and also make the staff be accountable. 
What do, you know why I keep saying that? Because everybody makes mistakes. I don't care about when my staff makes a mistake. What I need them to be, I'm going to give you the story in a second. I need them to be accountable. Because if that's not the case, then how do you know that it's not going to get repeated in three or four or six months? I came into practice Wednesday morning. And I was told as I walked through the door, I love to share any stories with you because I know you, you can relate to them. I was coming through the door. I, I can imagine this. I'm not even in my office 30 seconds. And I'm told as I walk by my front desk that the patient scheduled for 90 minutes for an extraction, implant, and graft on number 30 didn't want to do it because she had second thoughts that the tooth only quote unquote exploded on her once in her 50 years, which was about a month ago and hasn't bothered her since. Of course, she was on antibiotics. I should, the backstory here is this patient that I'm telling you about flew home early from California because she was given an opinion out there to extract 30 and 31. And she had so much faith in me, she came back, flew early to get my opinion. I took a CBCT. I consulted with my endodontist. My conclusion is that she did need number 30 removed. For my colleagues around the world, I guess we're talking about 4-7. No, 4-6, sorry. I always like to do that. Try to remember your system. So think about that. Also, I have to also give you the backstory that 15 years ago, I did a procedure on this patient. I removed a severely impacted palatal cuspid that was palatally impacted, grafted, did an implant, restored it, and I actually published that. Now they're telling me that this patient that I just gave you the backstory on doesn't want to have an implant, even though she, I just told you what had happened. Something didn't sound right. So I walked back to the operatory and I said, whatever you want to do, we're going to do. Okay, we don't have to do this. That's where it's how I started. I said, but it doesn't sound like you. What's, what's going on? So she handed me a pack of sedation pills or what was supposed to be sedation pills that was an antibiotic that she was given by my front desk. So she wasn't sedated. And her statement was, I just feel like the universe is telling me not to do this today. And by the way, I said, I agree. Even though it cost me an hour and a half of productivity. By the way, that's kind of a good example, which I didn't tell you that for this reason. To remember in your, in your practice, like never push a patient. Yeah, there's a side of me that says, are you kidding me? I'm just giving up 90 minutes because I can't get those 90 minutes back, but I never think like that. I think long-term on everything. And I got a person in a chair that I want a relationship with, and I believed her. She really didn't want to do it that day. And, but the reason wasn't because it only blew up once in the last 50 years of her life or whatever, I, whatever age she was. It was because she was supposed to be sedated. She knew she was supposed to be sedated. But she was given um, amoxicillin. And amoxicillin doesn't sedate. I'm being, you know, I'm obviously being a little cocky here when I say that. So I went naturally ballistic on my team. I mean, I didn't scream at them. But don't tell me that the patient had a change of heart about the tooth when the real truth is you gave her the wrong pack of medicine. That's what I mean by accountability. Okay. Boy, I'm running really late on this. I apologize. But that actually felt pretty good. Felt like I was telling you exactly a principle of what I was trying to get across. Making people accountable. The third step I gave you this year was putting thoughts into action by mastering meetings. Remember me talking about that? 
I talked about the morning meeting and I talked about the monthly meeting and what you need to do for those. So you can follow up those with any questions that you have. Today is the fourth one. And I apologize, it's taken me 20 minutes to get to it. And the fourth principle is being relentless in your pursuit of excellence. Now that sounds like a, a kind of a thing that Vince Lombardi would say, and he did in fact say things like that. I don't care if he said it. It's absolutely true. If you want to reach a higher level of success that you're then you're at right now. By the way, in my opinion, this statement goes for everyone. Those of you in dental school, D3s, D4s, D1s. It goes for every associate who's not happy enough and it certainly goes for new practices, new practice owners. And it goes for those of you that have been practice for 20 years and maybe you hit the wall. That happens. I've talked to clinicians, many clinicians, that had 20 years of astounding success and fell off the cliff all of a sudden. So you have to be relentless. So let me give you some examples of why I'm saying that to you. I had a really bad first seven weeks of 2023. I did. I mean, horrific. As I'm giving you the podcast over the last two months, I'm, I can't believe what's happening in my practice during that time. And I'm glad I'm telling you this because I've said it in other ways to you before that having a multi-million dollar productive practice doesn't mean you never hit a slump. But it had been so long since I had hit a slump, over two years, and I hit one. And I got to the point where I, I remember I heard myself saying, to my new patient coordinator, my Michelle, who's been around for 40 years. By the way, we are doing a, the a next series in I, the last two podcasts were with Michelle and I'm doing one next week with her. But I wanted to get this one in here. So why was I off? The truth of the matter is sometimes it's something you don't have control of. Look, I, I'm not, people call when they call. So there was a lack of new patient calls. It's just absolutely true. And when that happens, usually I'm all over it way before I was this time. In other words, I changed my marketing. Every marketing strategy I've ever used, whatever my theme was for the time I was given it, eventually gets stale and does not produce the results that it once did. I don't care what it was. Number two, there was a lack of quality new patients that did call. And that was really frustrating to me. I just can't tell you how many patients called, came and got into my office, had no money, bad credit, and we screen for that. I mean, we, don't, we can't ask them to fill out a credit score when they call, but we're pretty darn good at it, at figuring out and screening patients that there's ways to approach that. And if you want to, I don't want to talk about it in a podcast because it's going to take too long, but I'm trying to give you reasons. I'm, part of it was just bad timing in my circle of life of my practice. I just wasn't getting the calls in January. I wasn't even getting the calls in early February. I mean, period. I also have to tell you that I was out of the office. I was from December the 9th to mid-January. And when I did come back, I was a shell of who I was. I mean, I was incredibly weak. I'm still very weak. So I'm telling you, I had a lack of energy. And Steve Rasner normal energized Steve Rasner wouldn't have waited till now to change his marketing or not waited to now to address the staff, which I did. And I am happy to tell you that we're back with an atmosphere that is new patients calling, 
new patients accepting treatment, whatever it is. I mean, I got to be out frank with you. I really, when I came back in mid-January, I, I could give a hoot about anything except, can I even get through this day? And I'm not saying that to you to have you break out your violin for me. It's just true. Yet, this is what I know. I know that feeling sorry for myself that my practice productivity was fell off a cliff. Nobody was feeling sorry for me or coming to rescue me. I never, ever think that. And that's what I mean when I say you need to be a warrior. You are always going to, every one of you listening to me tonight, you are going to run into situations in your long career that seem overwhelming, that seem like you never can get past them. Now, some of them, they come in all forms. My recent one was health. I can't pretend I didn't have back surgery. And I can't pretend I didn't have severe pain. But there are other things, the loss of loved ones, the health of one of your other loved ones, that's not good. And of course it's normal to react. and But at some point, if you intend to stay in dentistry, which most of you are going to do no matter what happens in your career, unless you're incapacitated, you have to like find a way to regroup. So how the takeaway, how did I get jump started back? Well, your MO number one, listen to me, this is important and I've taken a lot of time. Your MO needs to be to always do the right thing. So you never can panic, even after six or seven weeks of not getting a single significant treatment plan. You can't start worrying about changing up things if you're a lion-hearted dentist. A lion-hearted dentist always does the right thing. You never start looking for work, if you will. It is either there or it is not there. And if you're really doing it the right way, and I know many of you are, you don't change that. So that's number one. And I know that may not sound profound, but do you remember me telling you in other podcasts, do you remember me telling you that even when patients don't accept treatment in my office, and many in the month of January and early February did not, I said, I felt like I, <laughs> all I felt like myself doing was single full coverage crowns. I would have like five of them in one day. That hasn't happened to me in years. And so you can't, you got to stick to what's ethical. You got to stick to what is comprehensive. You know, the lion-hearted dentist takes a comprehensive approach to his examinations. And he always remains or she always remains ethical. Number two, you have to be vigilant with what's going on around your office. And quite honestly, in other words, what are the reasons? Are there any reasons you can hear and or see that would explain why your office could be off? Now, I just told you with the lack of patients calling, some of it's got nothing to do with what's going inside your office, but sometimes it does. And being vigilant is exhausting. So what I mean when I say that is when you're negatized because cash flow is down and cash flow is down because you don't have any significant treatment acceptance, it's easy to have the energy just be sucked out of you and just not deal with things. And you can't do that. You've, you've got, you must, you must be a warrior and do what needs to be done. So I looked around my staff at things. So part of the problem was broken appointments, broken hygiene appointments. And I went to my front desk team that I love. I've had many front desk employees over the years. And the three that are there now and have been there for a while, I really, they're fun. 
They bring levity to my office. You know, in the clinic, we don't have a lot of time to have levity. And so it's nice. And they're great with patients. And they're also sometimes sloppy with confirmations. And I, I don't need anybody to prove that to me because I've been in practice for 42 years. So I went to them. I did. I brought them in my office. And I had a series of meetings with them as well as many other members of my team that on, on, and I didn't, I don't yell. So when you hear me say, I need them to be accountable, you're never going to get anywhere as a leader by screaming and yelling and pointing figures and just being rude. That doesn't accomplish anything except having employees leave you. And I had proactive meetings. I said, look, I told him what I just told you, how I feel about him. I said, but I hear and see too much wasted time. And I hear and see too many broken appointments in my hygiene schedules. And right now I am really relying on work spinning off of hygiene if it's there. And it's never there if there's not a patient in that chair. You're not doing a good enough job. I said it just like that. What that means is I don't know how you're confirming. I don't know if you're relying on solution reach too much. I don't know what it is, but I know for a fact it's not good enough. So I had that kind of meeting. I also was frustrated. I don't know if you've heard me over the years talk about me coming home and writing up charts and being here late. And I met and met several times with my hygiene team. And I have taught them the art of writing up a new patient chart as if I wrote it. And it was, it was extensive and difficult and to transfer the knowledge to make me happy that that's a complete write-up. Just the way that you would have written it, doctor. But I have them do that now. So it's made my life personally at home way better. It's got nothing to do with productivity. Well, maybe it does. It doesn't have me burned out at night. I went back to my team and reminded them that there's no reason when I come in, at, if I come in at nine o'clock and you're standing at the front desk, I'm talking because they have a morning meeting every day. And if hygiene's there at 9.05 and there's patients in the reception room, there's a problem. It's a visual problem for me. And the same in my clinical staff. And it was happening. And when I investigated why it was happening, people weren't getting into the office on time enough. So I started, I don't know, for a lack of a better word, cracking down. I had even had talks with my associates. This is what I know about young associates. Many of you treatment plan large restorations that need indirect laboratory or printed restorations. In other words, a laboratory restoration instead of a large direct clinical filling. And I get it. It's intimidating sometimes. The patient says, can I just have a... When the patient says to you, can I just have a filling? They're also saying, can it just be less money? And you have to have a wrap down, if indeed it needs a crown. And trust me, there's clinical situations that I'm thinking of in my head right now. There's no dentist in the world that wouldn't full coverage them. And what happens is patients get selective amnesia. So the filling, the hero dentist provides a filling that the patient loves them for six months until that fails or even two years. And then the patient remembers that they spent three or 400 hours for the filling. And now we want well over a thousand, if not more, for a crown. And that patient remembers that. You are no longer the hero. You are the failure. Why didn't you do tell me to do that the first time? So I had those talks and it has helped. And it's not about, you know, it's not really about, again, clearly it's not about turning a, a, a tooth to be, that could be filled with a crown to be more productive. That is obviously never the intent of a lion-hearted dentist. 
It is simply saying to you that if a tooth needs a crown, you need to have an intelligent wrap down as to why. And I, if you want it, I will write it and send it to you. And then you can practice it in the mirror. In fact, I'll write that down and have that ready. So number three reason I came out of this is I provide sedation. And if you provide sedation in your community, it's just physically impossible for, for a new patient eventually that needs your services not to find you. Four, I, we, my office, and I hope you, provide services outside the scope of just being a regular GP, which is how I started this whole podcast today. And then lastly, if you go back to one of my podcasts, and I'll continue this one next week, about your goal is to develop a hurricane size practice. What do I mean by that? Well, a hurricane is a big storm, right? And of course, I'm not implying that your practice become a storm, but I am implying that you have this gigantic cloud of patients because some of your patients may never be anything other than ambassadors of goodwill in that cloud, not ready for comprehensive therapy, but you never can buy enough of goodwill. So they're in that cloud. They trust you. They came to your office once. They like you. They just never did anything. You're going to have three types of patients in the cloud. The active patient that always goes with the recommendations. They probably have been with you for 20 plus years if you practice that long. You tell them they need a crown, they do a crown. You tell them an implant, they do an implant. You tell them every four months, they come in. Then you have the active patient that occasionally does maybe something you ask them to do. Active meaning they come every six months or four months. They just never have had comprehensive care. And you know who I'm talking about. You have this patient, they have a relatively healthy mouth. They have many teeth that should probably be crowned, but they don't have decay. They have large restorations on them that it would be unlikely that this tooth will last their career without cracking. They may have a malaligned dentition. Okay, so I'm, they're active. They just never went for full comprehensive restorative. And then you have non-active patients that you don't even think that they like you. Do you think they, yet, do you ever have a patient come in that was recommended by a patient that's not even a patient of yours? I have, so have you. That's the patient that you left a good taste in their mouth. They never accepted treatment and, and say so you get my point. I really want to continue with this next week about the hurricane. And that's what saved me. That's what I've lived off of for the first five to six weeks until new quality patients came into my office. And I'm talking about, that's how it started to get better. I'm talking about a patient that hadn't been to me in five years that had a left lower implant bridge restored. It was in his notes that he needed the same on the right. He had an old bridge on root canal teeth that did not hurt, but had recurrent decay, and he couldn't afford it. And the bridge was in place, and he declined treatment until three weeks ago. He was in that cloud because he trusted me. I didn't, I didn't put the fear of God in him and tell me he had to do it You know, five years ago. I told him the truth, that it could explode on him, or it may not. That's what dentistry is. Anyway, guys, the takeaway here is I had a pretty rough six weeks to start 2023. And last week, we did over six digits collections, productions, which is what I'm used to. And this is some of the reasons it happened and the same reasons it'll happen for you. Hope you had a good week. Hope you're having a decent year. Reach out to me, Dr. Rasner at AOL.com. Thanks for listening.